Welcome to the Building Classroom Community Podcast, the show where we talk about all aspects of building community among the learners in your classroom so that every student feels welcome, safe, empowered, and heard. It's a beautiful, hot Sunday morning here in Southern California, and today is the last official day of my summer break. I am your host, Andrea Earl, and I'm so excited to start this journey with you. The purpose of this podcast is to help classroom teachers refine their instructional practice through actionable strategies gleaned from colleagues and my almost four decades in the classroom. If you're listening to this show audio only, know that all of the slides will be shared in the show notes. So let's get started. When we think about building classroom community, we need to start with the characteristics of an effective teacher because it is the teacher who sets the tone for everything that will occur in the classroom. According to Harry and Rosemary Wong, there are three characteristics of an effective teacher. One, the teacher has positive expectations for student success. Two, the teacher knows how to design lessons for student mastery. And three, the teacher is an extremely good classroom manager. manager. Now, I don't know about you, but as a new teacher, I really struggled with classroom management. None of my coursework prepared me to manage 30 plus little humans while implementing engaging lessons, completing paperwork, dealing with parents, and you know, the list goes on. One of my master teachers told me not to smile until November. Another told me that if students were not sitting quietly, taking notes on everything I said, they were not learning. In both of these classrooms, students sat quietly in rows and complied for the most part with teacher instructions. Non-compliance was quietly ignored and disruptive behavior was removed from the room. But these classroom practices didn't mesh with my vision of what teaching and learning should look like. I envisioned my students working together in groups, talking about ideas, creating projects, asking questions, and in short, enjoying learning new things as much as I did. So, as a lifelong learner, I reached out to colleagues, observed effective teachers, attended trainings, and I read some books. The book that has had the most impact on my classroom management style is The First Days of School by Harry and Rosemary Wong. And I'll be honest, it took me a while and a lot of trial and error before I was able to develop my classroom management style that worked for me and my students. And even after all these years in the classroom, I'm still refining my practices to best meet the needs of the learners in my room. Being an effective teacher and creating a flourishing classroom community are skills to be developed and honed over time. It is my hope that the ideas shared in this podcast will help you reflect on your own practice and consider what changes you might make for the coming year. So let's get started. Being an effective teacher and creating a thriving classroom starts with a plan, and that plan needs to be in place before students even walk in the door. And in my opinion, the first part of that plan needs to focus on the nuts and bolts of classroom management. Now, when I say classroom management, some people get their feathers ruffled, but I wanna be clear that my interpretation of, of this term is that is a classroom full of students who are engaged, who are actively learning, part of the learning process, a classroom where students feel supported and challenged, where mistakes are part of the learning process, and a place where students want to be six hours a day, five days a week, 180 days a year. That's that's what I'm talking about with classroom management. So let's break it down. What are the parts of a good classroom management plan? Your classroom management plan should have rules and expectations, classroom procedures, physical environment needs to be taken into consideration, and the teacher needs to intentionally design opportunities for students to connect and build community. Also, the teacher needs to be organized and clearly communicate those expectations to students and needs to be consistent. In this episode, we're gonna specifically be focusing on rules, expectations, and procedures. The other elements will be discussed in upcoming upcoming episodes. So according to Harry Wong, the purpose of a rule is 
to prevent or encourage behavior by clearly stating student expectations. Rules can be general, for example, treat each other with respect, or respect personal and public property. General rules give you a lot of flexibility and a large range of behaviors can be covered by a few rules. But rules can also be specific, for example, arrive to class on time, or devices and headphones shall only be used when permitted by the teacher. Or my personal favorite, no gum on campus. I hate stepping in gum. Specific rules clearly outline an expectation. But the thing about a rule is that you need to consider what the appropriate consequence will be if a rule is broken. For example, no gum on campus. Well, the consequence for a student chewing gum might be to pick up trash. But for a rule like respect personal and public property, the consequence might be different based on how the student violated the rule. For example, a student who didn't clean up their, their trash after lunch, the consequence might be picking up trash. But if a student is caught writing on a wall, the consequence is gonna be something totally different. Now, luckily, many schools now have school-wide discipline plans in place. If you're not sure, please check with your administration and see what rules have been set up school-wide. These extensive plans not only include the rules, but they also re include rewards and consequences. This means that you as the classroom teacher don't need to create your own set of rules. Instead, you just need to support the school-wide plan. If, however, you do need to create your own set of classroom rules, consult with other teachers in your grade level or department. Think about what's reasonable, fair, and enforceable. Rules should be clear and have logical consequences. Also, try to limit your classroom rules to five. This will make them easier for you and your students to remember and easier for you to enforce. And the more consistent you can be across your school, grade level, and building, the easier it will be for everyone. Consistency about rules can build a community of understanding among staff and students. But now let's talk about expectations and how they're a little bit different from rules. I'll be honest, over the last 20 years, I've moved away from classroom rules and instead have established classroom expectations. Expectations are broader and leave room for student growth. Expectations are an, an ideal you want students to work towards. Here are some expectations I had for my seventh grade math students. They included arrive on time prepared to learn respect personal property and the property of others, and ask questions. I like how these expectations are broad, but give students a goal to work towards. They also have a lot of facets to them. So arriving to class prepared to learn, that means being in your seat on time. It means having your materials. It means having your materials out and ready. There's a whole lot that's encompassed within that one expectation. Again, when you're setting up your class expectations, try to aim for about five. Again, easier for students and you to remember and follow. But there are a lot of situations that come up during the day that may not be covered by your rules or expectations. For example, what happens when a student needs to charge their Chromebook or use the restroom? What happens if a student shouts out in class or is disruptive in some other way? Having rules for all these situations would be overwhelming for both you and your students. Think about, for example, when a student doesn't have a pencil in class. If you had a rule that said you must have a pencil in class, it means there needs to be a consequence for not having a pencil. But what would be an appropriate consequence for not having a pencil? In, I mean, give the student detention, have them pick up trash. That just doesn't seem like it's related in any way to not having a pencil. So instead of having a rule for having a pencil in class, you make it an expectation that students come to class prepared, and then you have a procedure for when the student does not have a pencil. In my classroom, if a student didn't have a pencil, I had a box of golf pencils in the back of the room. 
a student could simply get out of their seat, go to the box, take a pencil, go back to their seat and keep working. There was zero disruption to the class flow, nothing I had to do, and the student was able to self-manage and take care of themselves. Now, why a golf pencil, you may ask? Number one, they're cheap. Number two, students really don't like writing with them. So by having them use a golf pencil, which they're not big fans of, they're much more likely to bring their real writing utensils the next day. Also, if you have like a rule and call out a student that didn't bring a pencil, you may unwittingly be uh, singling out a student who maybe can't afford a pencil, right? Or a student who just simply forgot or lost it between you and the class before him. So by having a simple classroom procedure, grab a, grab a pencil from the, the box, use it, it's yours, move on. I've eliminated a whole uh, potential disruption to my class. Classroom procedures are all cover all of the things that you want students to do during the day. Unlike rules, if a student doesn't follow a procedure, there's no consequence or punishment. Instead, they simply you simply reteach the procedure. So at the beginning of the year, I go over the first time a student doesn't, doesn't have a pencil, I explain the procedure, the student gets up, walks, demonstrates, or you can even do that with a random student. Let's pretend you forgot your pencil today and let's show the class what you're gonna do. By practicing the procedure, there's no stigma, there's no negative, it's just what happens in class. Matter of fact, move on. Let's now think about, I want you to think about some of the other things that go on in your class that you need to develop procedures for. Think about everything that happens during the day, especially those little things that really annoy you. And let's set up some procedures. These procedures, write them down, articulate them in detail because they're the core of your plan, the core of your classroom management plan and the first step in building classroom community. Now I'm gonna take a few minutes and share a few other of my classroom procedures. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years teaching middle school math, uh, science and an elective. So I had a lot of procedures covering a lot of different things. So the first one I wanna share is my procedure for students entering class. Every day, every period, I would stand at the door and greet students. I'd call them by name, I'd shake their hand, look them in the eye, ask them how they were doing before they were able to enter class. This procedure did a couple things. First, it's, it made a personal connection between myself and the student. Sometimes that's the only personal connection your students, that student might have had with an adult all day. The second thing it does is it slows students down. Instead of running in class and rushing around, no matter what was happening before they came to me, it gives them a chance to slow down, take a breath, and enter class in a calm manner. I also think that it really shows students that you care about them. By looking them in the eye, noticing they got a haircut, they're wearing a new sweater, whatever. That personal connection goes a long way to helping you build that community in your classroom. The second part of that procedure, after students entered, after the handshake and walking in the door, students would find their seats, they would get their materials out without being told, and they would start on the bell work, which was always posted on the board. By the time the beginning of class bell rang, my students were already working, and I didn't have to do a thing, and I didn't have to say anything. This gave me time to take attendance, uh, look at any absent notes, you know, answer any questions from students. Basically gave me a, a minute of breathing room and students got right to work. Another procedure that I said for my classroom was for students that didn't bring their notebooks. In my math class, every student had a math, a graph paper notebook. But occasionally the students would forget them. So my procedure was simple, kind of like the pencils. 
I had a stack of graph paper and plain paper and line paper in the back of the room. They could simply go, take a piece, do their work. The next day, they would simply tape or glue their, the work they did on paper into their notebook. Again, didn't involve me at all. Students totally self-regulated. Another procedure was students returning from an absence. Now this was a four-parter. So first of all, we have at the school I was at, we had absence notes, so physical notes student brought into class. Well, instead of students like throwing it in my face and handing it to me or putting it on my desk, I had a little basket. They put it in the basket. They then went to the back of the room where I had a folder for each period and they could look and see if there was any work in there that they had missed. If so, they would take it and return to their seats. Uh, the students would check with the students at their table, see any items they may have missed from the agenda, which I also post online. And then, it, then if the students did have any questions about the work that they missed, they could come see me either during nutrition or after school. I didn't want to take class time to do individual conferences or indivi you know, answer individual questions. Then later in the period, while students were working, I would go, I would sign the note, I would mark it in my, you know, in my attendance records, and I would return the note to them. All this was nonverbal, didn't involve me interacting with the student at all, because again, they knew the procedures, and it kept the class flowing. All right, another thing that would annoy me during class is students that had to go to the bathroom in class. You know, I know there's teachers that say, well, if I can hold it for all period, you can too. But let's be honest, they're students, they're kids. But I did have a procedure for that. Uh, part of the procedure was there was no using the restroom the first five minutes or the last five minutes of class. And that was actually a school-wide procedure. Um, and that involved for safety and for students wanting to, you know, leave class early. The second part is I had a little sign at the back of the room. Students just wrote their names. They could go, came back, the time, and I kept track of that just to see if students were going, you know, always going at the same time or going a lot. Um, and they couldn't just get up while someone was talking to the whole class. So they had to do it during group work time, independent work time, but not while someone was addressing the whole class, whether it was myself or another student. And then the last thing is that I told students, you're welcome to use the bathroom during class, but you owe me 10 minutes after school. It was an, it was an understanding, it was a, a procedure that everyone knew that that was, that was the procedure. I'll be honest, when they'd come back after school, I would just send them on their way. But by putting that procedure in place, it kind of cut down on the students who just wanted um, to go to the bathroom for, for no reason that really didn't need to use it. But I also had students that just kind of needed a break from the class. They just needed to go outside and breathe. And my procedure for that was, as long as nobody's talking to the class as a whole, go outside, take some deep breaths, but stand in front of the windows just so I can see you, right? So I know where you are for safety. Take your breather. And when you're ready, come back in, rejoin the group. Again, I didn't have the hand, the hand raising, the, ooh, I got to go, the yelling out. It eliminated all of that. Made my class run much more smoothly. All of these procedures that I just shared, again, I'm going to reiterate, they're non-intrusive. They don't infringe on your time with your students. The students learn, you teach the procedures, and we'll talk about that more in another episode. But once students understand the procedures, the class can almost run itself. In fact, I was stuck in a meeting um, one morning before first period, the bell rang, the teacher next door opened the door, let the students in. When I came, when the assistant principal went up, realizing that I wasn't in the room and she walked into the room, the students were all working. Every single student was on task working on their bell work and she just had to stand there. There was nothing that she needed to do until I was able to get back to the room. So setting up a good foundation of classroom procedures can really streamline your workflow and help you build that community in your classroom. All right, so now it's your turn. I want you to think about the situations that occur in your class during the day. 
what procedures do you want students to follow? Now, while you may come up with a list, you need to come up with a list now before school starts, you're probably gonna tweak some of those procedures after you get the kids in your room, when you see how things work, but start with a plan now. I'll be honest, even after all of these years teaching, I still write down my classroom procedures by hand on a yellow notepad in detail because I want to make sure that all of my procedures are logical, make sense, and I've developed them with intentionality. Everything I do in my classroom, I do with intentionality. Although to the outsider, it might look like, a, like I, I haven't planned, but that is the best kind of planning, isn't it? When things just run so smoothly. Think about the rules, expectations, and procedures that you want for your students this year, for your classroom to run smoothly. These are gonna be the backbone of, of an effective classroom management system and it's going to be the they'll be the cornerstone cornerstone of building a productive classroom community. I encourage you to collaborate with your colleagues, but remember the procedures need to work for you and your students. In the next episode, I will share ways you can effectively communicate your classroom rules and expectations and how you can explicitly teach them to your students. Building classroom community is key for both you and your students. So go forth and plan. If you have any questions, comments, or rules and expectations you'd like to share, please leave feedback and let's get connected. My website is thedigitalteach.com. And remember, teaching is a work in progress. So let's keep all comments kind and let's work together to create communities where you and your students can thrive. Thank you for joining me today.